Visual Clinicians, this is Ali Nis, uh, coming to you from the beautiful Boston Public Library. I wanted to do a little video for you as a follow-up to a previous video that I made on pulp biology, which was very popular, I had a lot of views on, and follow-up to that video, I would like to make another video, not in the topic of uh, pulp biology, which I think every restorative dentist should know about, but on uh, something which is the next step, which is pulp pathology. So in situations in which the pulp can get infected or microbially infected, and let's talk about some of the etiology as well as the path of, through which the uh, pulp uh, will go as it becomes necrotic. So let's go inside and uh, talk about this. All right, so we'll come inside now. What we're gonna try to do is a continuation of that very first kind of educational video that I made, which was directed at talking about uh, the histology, or rather so much about the developmental biology of the roots and the dentin, and that what has caused, what causes some of the sensitivity that you see during restorative dentistry and various types of insults that cause pain and sensation to the tooth and why do we get cold sensitivity or how does the tooth respond to electric pulp tester and so on. And now we're moving beyond these types of stimulations of the pulp and move directly into the pathology of the pulp and how it could lead into periapical pathology. So I'm gonna to try to do this without really interruption off the top of my head and um, I'm sorry if there are gonna be any specific things that I'm gonna miss out, but basically what it comes out of my head is how I'm going to uh, present it to you. Let's say the microbes from the biofilm that is externally to the tooth that forms the plaque and then due to the constant source of food uh, and sugar from the, um, the diet will increase the production of acid through your lactobacillus and the strip mutans that sticks to it and lactobacillus starts to break down the dentin and then you have a demineralization front that moves down into the tooth, erodes the enamel, and once it gets into the dentin, starts to follow the dental tubules and get closer and closer to the dental pulp. As the, the, this, the, as the infection starts to get closer to the pulp, through the dental tubules, some of the um, byproducts of the microbes start to get ahead of the caries and start to create a stimulation into the dental pulp. Of course, we have the dental odontoblasts uh, processes that are extending directly into the dental tubules that are going to sense these um, stimulation and these uh, products and the odontoblasts are going to start to create reactionary dentin and as the as the infection front gets closer and closer to the pulp some of the odontoblasts processes and odontoblasts themselves may die and they are going to get replaced through the differentiation of the fibroblast inside the pulp into new odontal blasts that are going to start to form reparative dentin, which is a more amorphous type of a dentin, and its job is to essentially patch the area where this, this type of stimulation is coming from. It's body's own natural defense mechanism against microbes and against the uh, insult that you can see coming in from outside. The dental pulp is a sterile environment for the most part, and any type of an antigen that can create an inflammatory response will stimulate the formation of dentin as a natural, pro natural process by which we try to uh, avoid infection of that space. What ends up happening from a circulatory point of view inside the pulp, what you may not realize about the pulp is that per volume, it is one of the most perfused tissues in your oral cavity. So you have a very high density of capillaries that kind of enter through a series of arteries and arterioles and the branch out through a capillary plexus that is in the subadonoblastic layer. And this, um, um, these are the, the, the vasodilation of these, of these uh, capillaries is uh, directed and is um, um, regulated by the neuropeptides that are present that are released by the uh, C fibers. So as in the previous video we said we have the, on the periphery of the pulp we have the a delta fibers that are myelinated and are responsible for the fast, sharp shooting pain that patients get in the earlier par parts of the inflammation. As the inflammation moves a little bit deeper, it starts to involve the C fibers that are in fact about 90% compared to 10% only uh, a delta fibers in terms of their uh, abundance far more numerous C fibers, and these are involved with the neuroregulation. They release a number of neuropeptides, the CGRP and the substance P, and these types of uh, uh, neuroinflammatory modulators that they release, and then that causes 
uh, dilation of the capillaries around the pulpal area, which will increase the pulpal blood flow. As the pulpal blood flow increases, they're going to bring some immune components with it. They're going to get a little bit more permeability on the dentin, so you end up releasing some more of these acute kind of inflammatory cells, some neutrophils and so on, are going to show up into the area. And by this time, the bacteria has reached and just gotten very close to the pulp. And at this point now, you end up having a direct confrontation with the microbes and our immune cells. And these create little micro abscesses in the coronal area of the pulp, which as, you know, as, as the infection progresses, will end up coalescing. The micro abscesses are going to coalesce and form necrosis. Now, of course, if at some point before this, all of this happens, I mean, you can have some hyperemia, but before you have a frank infection of the dental pulp, through restorative procedures, we are able to remove these microbes, which are the source of the infection. The body can potentially heal itself as long as there's no constant source of bacteria. That essentially is what, from a clinical point of view, uh, will differentiate the state of reversible pulpitis versus irreversible pulpitis. Pulpitis, which is inflammation of the pulp, is essentially a reaction to some kind of a stimulus, which is, if it's temporary due to some injury to the pulp, because of you know chemical mechanical trauma so a lot of that can be reversible but if the microbes are involved and that trauma is constant and it's not going away then it can progress and as i mentioned once it crosses this barrier where you end up having micro abscesses coalesce you're going to basically end up having necrosis we don't have yet a very clear definition of what on a clinical diagnostic point of view we have compared to to the histological picture of inflammation but we know that for the most part some of those telltale signs that indicates that we have moved from reversible to irreversible are two important factors that are found one from a patient history and the other from clinical testing from a patient history point of view you find out if you have irreversible pulpitis if your patient tells you through your questioning and their immediate responses, if they have spontaneous pain or they've had spontaneous pain historically. Patients that are w woken up from pain or patients, I usually say, does it ever show up when you're just sitting around watching TV that you have pain or throbbing and you know those kinds of things? And if they say yes, that is one of the important indications. The other one is when you have a response to the cold that is lingering. And that's kind of the cold response as we mentioned in the previous video is, triggered by the A-delta fibers and their, through the Branstrom theory of pain, are theorized to be related to the movement of fluids that is caused by cold uh, as the fluid is kind of sucked out through application of the cold into the dental tubules. It'll stimulate the A-delta fibers. It will send a sharp uh, signal to the brain, a sharp pain to the brain. And if that sharp response lingers beyond the removal of you know, 10, 15 seconds beyond the removal of the cold application, it means that the damage to the A delta and the inflammation in the pulp is far beyond normal. And combined with the history of spontaneous pain, these two create a picture that is more likely irreversible pulpitis. Again, once again, these two do not necessarily 100% all the time correlate, but these have been shown from the histor uh, histological picture with the clinical response of most patients to be highly indicative. So let's put it that way. So once you have necrosis up on the top, then the microbes pour into the dental pulp. Now, what's important to understand is that the endodontic infections are not uh, single microbes. They are, for the most part, polymicrobial. You know, we have somewhere in the body, a couple thousand, two, three thousand species of microbes have been uh, identified, uh, of which we have found somewhere in the order of, you know, 1,000 to 1,500 microbes have been isolated in the oral cavity. And in the endodontic diseases, uh, we have found somewhere around 100 different types of bugs have been associated with uh, the uh, odontogenic infections related to the dental pulp. Of course, you have to keep in mind that the biggest challenge in these types of identification processes are the fact that, you know, previously we've been using culturing and different types of techniques to identify the microbes. But this area and this environment inside the dental pulp is a very difficult one to get proper isolation. So the latest molecular techniques are showing us the preponderance of a number of microbes that are present and that it, in fact, in almost um, all endodontic infections, 
it is a polymicrobial process. So you have somewhere in the order of two to you know 40 different uh, microbes are present at the same time causing this process of necrosis. And what's interesting is that the fact that you have so many different microbes in a bigger set of uh, the microbiology of pulpal disease kind of can potentially explain the reason why some patients have more pain than others during the process of necrosis. Of course, the patient's own immune system, their own response, their own you know, neural profile in terms of perception of pain and their, um, um, the way they process it are all factors, but from a microbiological point of view, there's also a difference in the kind of microbes that are associated with uh, pulpal necrosis. And as I mentioned, these are polymicrobial. And the other key to remember is that primary infections, which are the first time a tooth gets infected, rather than infections that are secondary or rather are following root canal therapy, for example, a root canal that fails, are also different in composition. It's been shown that primary infections are more polymicrobial, whereas the secondary infections of failed root canals, they have a lower number of species involved. Now, what's interesting is that for primary infections, although polymicrobial, there's usually a, a, a list of usual suspects that are present in these infections, and uh, they kind of are, um, you know, for the most part, they are faculty in the early part of infection that microbial profile is also different than the later part of the infection. In the early part of the infection, what you have is you have um, microbes that are for the most part, gram-positive uh, facultative anaerobes. And there are pretty much your strept, uh, streptococcus uh, species as well as enterococcus species. These are the kind of species that you will find in the early part of infection. Now, what's interesting is as the uh, odontogenic or the pulpal infection starts to move down towards the apex and as the tissue necrotizes and the microbes move down, what you end up having is you end up having a succession, it's called microbial succession, as the facultative, gram-positive facultative anaerobes start to get superseded by the uh, gram-negative obligate anaerobes, such as the, the sacrolytic and the asacrolytic um, uh, species of uh, Provotella and the Proformonas. Now, these, uh, two, uh, these two groups were previously, in the back in the 80s, they were uh, identified as the Bacteroides and the pigmented Bacteroides. I remember that we used to call them for some parts, early part of my schooling, we used to call them Bacteroides, pigmented Bacteroides, but now those are reclassified and they're called um, Proformonas and the Provotellas uh, species of microbes which are gram-negative anaerobes. And now, gram-negative anaerobes, what's interesting to know also, is that they have, by the fact that being they're gram-negative, they contain some lipopolysaccharide outer shell that makes them gram-negative so that they cannot basically accept the, um, the crystal uh, violet dye that makes them uh, a gram-positive. So that lipopolysaccharide uh, outer casing is actually highly, highly antigenic to uh, most humans. Now, what's interesting is that it's in fact more antigenic to some humans than others. And that's another reason why um, you end up having uh, different patterns of bone loss in different people because certain people may have a different genetic uh, phenotypic expression of some of the cytokines, including the interleukin beta and so on, which will then have a different profile in terms of bone loss. But uh, these lipopolysaccharides do trigger the, um, the release of the cytokines that causes uh, that kind of bone loss. Now, that, that is also done through a receptor. This is a receptor-mediated situation because the cytokines will end up releasing through a toll-like receptor, um, a, a bunch of uh, uh, rankle, and the rankle is what's actually activating uh, the, the, the osteoclasts that come into the area and start to, to lose the bone. And that bone loss is what you see radiographically and interpret as a radiolucency, and that's only bone loss, obviously, because radiographs don't show us infection. We only see bone loss, but then we infer that there is an infection because we don't expect to have bone loss uh, at that point uh, of the tooth, and that becomes a diagnostic picture that we use. So keep in mind, basically, the way it works is that you end up having the LPS, so the lipopolysaccharides, inducing the, uh, um, the release of rankle through the toll-like receptor and the macrophages, and um, that's what triggers the, um, the, the, the coalition of the monocytes that create the osteoclasts that remove the bone. Now, what's interesting is, again, as I mentioned, the preponderance and the amount of 
um, these gram-negative anaerobic microbes is also been implicated in the presence of more severe pain. So the more gram-negative uh, anaerobes, strict anaerobes that you have in an infection, the probably the higher likelihood that the patient's having a little bit more pain. Again, another one of those situations in which the the difference in the microbial um, kind of a combination uh, is what's causing the different manifestations of uh, the same disease on, the, on different patients. And in fact, even on the same patient, you could have one tooth that has a different combination of bacteria, and then another tooth that has a different combination of bacteria, and then one of the teeth could have gone totally necrotic asymptomatically, and the other one is patient, waking the patient up um, and is quite symptomatic. And you can have, I mean, you've seen those in the past, I'm sure, not only differences between patients, but also differences among patients, which is one of the reasons why I always tell patients in terms of post-op pain is to expect, you know, usually I like to see the line that I use clinically is, you know, I like to prepare you for the worst and hope for the best, but they have to understand that there's, you know, just the fact that they had one completely painless root canal before, uh, after, post-operatively, it doesn't necessarily mean that every post-op is the same. It's a combination of microbes and the immune system response is different to different microbes. Anyway, the microbes that we were talking about up until now, we were talking in terms of their presence in the planktonic form. Now, planktonic form means that these microbes are basically free and loose and they're floating around in the, in the, um, uh, in the root canal space. But what we see clinically, especially in cases of a little bit of a mature infection in which infection has been around for a little bit longer, let's say at least a couple of weeks or longer, a tooth has been necrotic, these free-floating planktonic bacteria start to settle on surfaces. The propensity for microbes in the planktonic form to settle on surfaces and then create these colonies of heterogeneous species of bacteria that work together and form the so-called biofilm is a significant piece of the puzzle here and one of the main reasons why endodontic infections are not as easy to address as we wish they were. So, when microbes in their planktonic form start to organize and form a biofilm, they are kind of imagine it as though if you have a bunch of Skittles floating around on a surface, they're kind of loose and you can easily wipe them off of a surface, or put a um, bunch of these Skittles or M&Ms on a surface and then pour caramel or, I don't know, crazy glue on top of them, and then let them sit. What, what, what happens then, all of a sudden, this um, microbes are now settling on a surface and they've been encased in this uh, EPS, which is the extracellular uh, polysaccharide matrix. And it, it, this is a basically the key thing here, is that the EPS here is really, really helping uh, shield the microbes. You know, one of the examples I use and analogies that I give to the students usually is that Planktonic bacteria are kind of like a bunch of human nomads out living in the, in the in a forest. As you know, they are pretty much defenseless, right? So, I mean, it's very easy to uh, have a war with a bunch of nomads that have no fortification. But if you go into a castle, into a fort, into a big city where you have a bunch of people working together and also being protected by the castle, but you have basically a biofilm. And that really is what it's really all about. Of course, the biofilm creates a whole bunch of different physiological mechanisms in which the microbes are in communication with each other genetically, and then they have this quorum sensing in which they send signals to each other. And then from there, they kind of shed and they go somewhere else and they create their own little biofilm so the biofilm really is what it's all about. And endodontic therapy and the addressing infections inside the root canal isn't really about addressing the planktonic form of bacteria that will just rinse out and it's easy to get rid of, but it's rather the addressing of the biofilm. So it's important to understand that because if you don't understand that, then you would think any of these research articles that are being done in which they basically throw one well, microbe into a, uh, a vat of any solution and it just is gone and it dies is representative of anything. What you need to have is materials that are able to, to deal and disinfect and destroy, disrupt and dis destroy the biofilm. And that's really the key thing. Okay, so I think this kind of gives you a, a, a fairly basic understanding of what's going on in terms of endodontic infections. 
Also, a couple of factors I wanted to say is that while we have this microbial succession that starts from the uh, kind of a, a gram-positive facultative anaerobes and turns into this gram-negative uh, obligate anaerobes, and different profiles of pain and uh, infection and the manifestation in the apical um, uh, breakdown of the bone in different people based on their own genotype, you also have to realize that microbes that I'm talking about aren't necessarily all bacteria. Other things such as viruses as well as even um, uh, um, funguses have been found inside endodontic infections and that's a key thing to keep in mind because we need to have systems of disinfection that are not just merely specific to uh, bacteria because based on some studies you know somewhere to the extent of eight to ten percent of these infections are contain also candida albicans and other kinds of um, fungus material and that's important that we kind of make sure that we uh, address that. So this is the, the, the key here is that, you know, not only isolation during the root canal therapy is important so that you don't end up getting any of the loose floating candida in the patient's mouth getting into the tooth right before I, before obturation, uh, but also our gutta percha cones should be disinfected because many of the times gutta percha cones that sit around on the shelf for extended periods of time can develop uh, mold and uh, candida can grow on and that's can, it can happen. So it's important that you disinfect your gut approach right before obturation or before even cone fitting by placing it in sodium hypochlorite for about 30 seconds to a minute. And that helps disinfect the surface. So a key to remember as well. In terms of viruses, all kinds of viruses have been found both inside dental infections as well as in periapical infections. But to that extent, uh, you know, that's not necessarily going to change much about our, uh, our protocols, but just know that they are there. Uh, some, uh, the, the, the amount of bacteria that you can find in a peripical infection outside the root has been a point of debate. Originally, historically, we used to think that these peripical lesions were sterile and that the bacteria only existed out inside the root canal and then they would shoot out uh, only microbial byproducts would get out and that it would create the periapical infection and the periapical radiolucency and bone loss was merely a reaction to the bacteria inside the root and bacterial byproducts. Today, we have had, over the past couple of decades, we've had better molecular mechanisms, you know, DNA hybridization and different types of uh, PCR and different uh, um, uh, fluorescence kind of testing of the pre lesions have shown and demonstrated there is bacteria present in these lesions. Of course, some people have argued that, you know, these molecular mechanisms don't tell us if the microbes that are out there are alive or not. But I can tell you easily that there certainly are some species of microbes, such as the actinomyces, you know, Israeli, and as well as the different kind of actinomyces uh, family of, uh, of, uh, um, of uh, microbes that can persist on their own outside the tooth in the periapical lesion as we've seen in those sulfur granules that are basically colonies of these actinomyces and they create a number of sinus tracts and so on. And these, I have had a number of patients myself that I have seen that have been misdiagnosed in the past for different things and these large um, periapical lesions have been present that hadn't been addressed. Anyway, so uh, this, I'm sorry, I, I was speaking very fast because I was trying to get a lot of information uh, in together. It was kind of off the top of my head, didn't really have proper organization. Okay, I hope this was helpful to you. Don't forget to comment below if this was good, bad, or any kind of feedback. I'm trying to do, um, you know, more clinical stuff and not as much of these uh, scientific stuff, but I do enjoy doing these two from time to time, and I hope it does help you. All right, folks, so this was a fairly basic review of pulp pathology. Of course, the subject is fairly complicated, has a lot of science behind it, and the field is evolving every day as we learn more about the, uh, you, know, you know, the microbiome and the role of different uh, microbes, not only in the overall body uh, and their role in our basic metabolism, but also in pulp pathology. So this quick review hopefully was uh, going to give you a little insight about what we're dealing with in terms of primary and secondary endodontic infections. And uh, you know, if you like the video, make sure you, you share it and uh, don't forget to follow us on social media. And for we will then I'm Ali Nese and let's save some teeth.